I just got back from vacation, so forgive me if I'm a little slow here. The jet lag is uh, is still in full effect. But I want to talk about something that is pretty serious. Uh, I just saw as I was getting back, in fact, I, I kind of was affected by this on the way home uh, from Europe where Hurricane Helene was wreaking havoc in the southeast U.S. And at the latest report here, it looks like there's over 119 or at least 119 people presumed dead and communities that have just been wiped off the map and survivors now are struggling to get food and water and i don't want to make light of this situation at all i think that it's very devastating and of course uh my my heart goes out to anyone that's affected by it and i hope everyone can be safe and, and find a solution to whatever problems they're facing uh, very soon. And I will actually present some ideas that maybe won't help today, but for those of you that watch this after the fact or people that know people that were affected, hopefully some of these things can actually uh, be helpful in the future uh, if, unfortunately, you know they're similarly affected. With that as the background for today's video, I want to talk about something that is more in my lane, which is these headlines coming out about EVs causing all kinds of damage after being flooded with salt water. Officials say salt water is causing electric vehicles to catch fire. Pinellas County near Tampa shared this video today. It did not say when and where it was taken, but it urged residents who evacuated to contact them so the fire department can check on their cars. So first and foremost, I just need to acknowledge that yes, uh, what is called saltwater intrusion does cause damage to electric vehicles and can lead to thermal runaway, which is where the cells get so hot that they actually catch fire or explode or you know unleash all of the energy that is stored in the cells themselves. So yes, this is a real issue. This isn't one I'm gonna gloss over and try to paint in a different light. It is very, very real. But I do want to put it in context and not overgeneralized a couple anecdotes here and there. And I want to just think about this in the broader context of what we're seeing with the devastation of this hurricane. So first and foremost, I want to give a kudos to Governor DeSantis in Florida, who put out a warning about this and is giving people advice on what to do. So definitely heed this advice. You know, there's a couple different options you have. One is to get to higher ground somewhere where you won't be affected by actually getting water in it. Of course, EVs can get wet. It's more about the salt water that comes in, and I'll explain a little bit about that uh, and why that's a specific issue versus just, say, rain. Um, but, yeah, take caution with this situation because you definitely don't want to be affected. And the way that works, and this comes from the Idaho National Laboratory who did a study on this, they looked at 10 different EVs that caught fire, what actually caused the fire in the different batteries, and then put it into perspective. So Hurricane Ian in 2022 is when they were studying this, and there were 3,000 to 5,000 EVs that were affected, and uh, 600 of them were a total loss, and 36 of them, or around 36 of them, caught fire. That right there should be cause for concern, absolutely. And then if you fast forward to Hurricane Adalia, Adalia, I don't know if I'm saying that right, in 2023, uh, it actually was a much lower number, and this is largely due to the weaker hurricane, plus the public awareness around EVs and getting them to higher ground. So again, the, the warnings that the government are putting out there may seem kind of obvious to some, but they are or appear to be having an impact on that, and that's great. Now, I wanna highlight though, that this isn't just electric vehicles that are actual subject to this. In fact, they're probably the ones that are least subject to it because of the advanced design of the battery systems. The things that are far more likely to have this issue would be e-bikes or power tools, uh, you know, electric lawnmowers, anything with a battery, essentially. There isn't as nearly as much kind of thermal management and protection as there is in an electric vehicle, say a Tesla. So the fact that that's happening at all is an issue but also we need to be aware that it's not just whether or not you have an EV. This is kind of how it happens. And you can see that there are some examples here uh, where flood damaged EVs are actually stored 50 feet apart. This is a recommendation from the EPA. Uh, that way, if there were to be any issues, it wouldn't cause any other damage. Um, and you can see the details of the study. As always, I'll put a link to this and all the other sources for this video down in the description. If you see something that's off, please note it in the comments. Please provide data with any claim that you make. Otherwise, it may be subject to removal. So make sure that 
we can have a fruitful discussion down in the comment section and help advance our understanding of this topic. Salt water in this way has caused issues in the past, but thankfully we are moving towards better solutions. In fact, as of 2022, different battery chemistries being used by almost all automakers out there known as lithium iron phosphate are far less likely to have this issue because the thermal threshold, meaning how hot they can get before they, uh, they reach that thermal runaway point, which is where they actually catch fire. Another measure is what's known as a battery passport. And some countries are actually already implementing this where the battery itself is almost going to have like a Carfax report where all the testing that's been done and the manufacturing of and every bit of information about the pack will be available to the owner when they actually take purchase of the vehicle. That way, you know, if there's any elevated risk, and in fact, we make it to the point where there's a regulation that says certain batteries of certain risk types cannot actually be sold. And then of course, the holy grail of this are solid state batteries. So solid state batteries are where they use a solid electrolyte versus a liquid one to separate the anode and the cathode. The anode and the cathode are the ones that actually store the energy and then the energy, the ions pass through the electrolyte, the, the barrier between them. And that's how the energy actually gets used or gets charged up. So depending on which way it's going. And that is where the thermal runaway can become an issue is if something shorts that out, something breaks that barrier between them, that's when things can kind of go south. And so with a solid state battery, it is using a solid, not liquid uh, separator there, and it's non-flammable. So this way, it'll actually be much less likely to have that thermal runaway issue. Uh, also, it'll you know improve charging times and range and density and all kinds of other benefits. And there are reportedly breakthroughs happening all the time. I haven't seen one in an actual vehicle. My friend Matt Farrell did a video where he was explaining how you can buy a portable battery. Uh, but you know, right now the, the the economics of it aren't really that great. But we are seeing this. It is a real thing. It's not like nuclear fusion, which is always 20 years away. Um, so down the road, this should really solve almost all of the issues that we're seeing now with these thermal runaways from saltwater intrusion accidents or whatever the case may be. And then, of course, we have the EV Fire Safe group down in Australia that are doing a ton of great research on this, uh, not only collecting data about it, showing exactly how EV fires are far less likely to occur than gas fires. But when they do occur, they are much more difficult to put out. And there's a lot of other issues that come along with it. And so they are developing training protocols for firefighters uh, worldwide and providing that information to them for free. They're in collaboration with companies like Tesla and many others. So the firefighting side of it is one that also has to evolve uh, because the fire fires are different. They burn hotter, they burn longer, they reignite. There's all kinds of other challenges with it, uh, regardless of the fact that they occur far less likely than a gas car does. The lithium battery, it got inundated and then blew up. And this was the aftermath, a charred electric vehicle surrounded by debris after the water rushed in. And because of the flooding that we've had, we've had some uh, lithium ion situations. It wasn't the only fire. This one was along Blanca Street. Except in this case, Tampa's mayor says a fire likely started by an electric car spread to the home. It was gutted by morning. Nothing left. Again, there's an example of what I would call overgeneralization. So just to put this in context again, we have billions of dollars of damage. We have almost a million people without power currently as of recording this. We have over 100 people dead. We have massive, massive devastation throughout this region. And the media is talking about one home that was affected. Not to say there aren't more, but it's one of those things where because it's clicky and because it plays on people's fears and because we can simply over generalize like uh, a lot of the the fear uncertainty and doubt propagandists out there do it's one of those things where i really just want to put this in perspective that we're talking about one home or in the case back in hurricane ian 36 cars that caught fire out of the hundreds of thousands that were existing in that area at the time. So it's really not something that is a tremendous worry, but definitely take care and take caution by moving the car to higher ground. And if you can't move it to higher ground, you could even do something like get this car capsule, which is like a, a bubble that your car sits in, uh, which is waterproof and it can float as well as it can protect it from things falling on it. You know, think about that if you have a very expensive car and there is a problem in your garage, 
garage, whether it be from a hurricane, wind, or whatever, things could fall in it and cause damage. The car capsule, if you're aware of something happening, could be something that is worth uh, checking into. So it's one of those things where there are solutions to these problems. It's not like this is an insurmountable thing, but I don't want to gloss over the fact and say that this isn't real. It definitely is real, but it is a problem that we absolutely can and are solving. But this really got me thinking about whether or not this is an issue generally. It's certainly, it's big in the media and very kind of salacious. People want to see these videos and look at this stuff and talk about it. And then it kind of sears into our minds. But if you zoom out a little bit and look at the data, as I like to do, and I think a lot of people do nowadays, we can see that the global EV market is actually still growing at a very healthy clip. So looking at data from EV volumes, I want to show you the year on year percentage growth for the first half of 2024 in the different regions. So Europe, Western and Central, we're looking at plus one percent year over year growth. That's basically flat. And there are many reasons for that. For example, uh, a lot of the countries phasing out their incentives like Germany and Norway. Also, the issues with Chinese EVs and tariffs. There's a lot going on in Europe right now. So sales are basically flat. If you look at China, though, they're up 31 percent, which is massive especially considering they are the world's largest EV market by far. In North America, we're up 12%, and in the rest of the world, they're up 41%, giving us a global year-on-year -year sales growth of 22%. So the EV movement is very healthy, very strong, still going strong all throughout the world, regardless of these little headlines here that kind of portray a much bigger space in our brain than you know the data actually would suggest that they are they should. And just to give a shout out to the incredible Hannah Ritchie of Our World and Data, she put it really well in this video from Big Thing. But actually, the world has already passed the peak of global sales of petrol and diesel cars. They peaked in 2018 and they are now falling. All of the growth in the car sector is now coming from electric vehicles. So we've already sort of hit the peak of gas car sales. They are on their way down and they're going to continue that trend as far as I can tell from all the research I've done. All the data suggests that EV growth, as we just looked at, is continuing to accelerate despite what the media may claim and despite what these other kind of anecdotal reports of issues that are popping up are. Now, there's two more quick things I want to talk about um, related to the hurricane, and these are not super EV related. One is power. Uh, you need power for almost everything in your life. Uh, and then the second one is water. Aquafant is a company that I purchased a product from maybe two years ago now almost uh, when I saw them at a fully charged conference here in San Diego. And their product is this countertop machine that essentially is if you were to combine a dehumidifier with a reverse osmosis system and then a UV light filter. So what it does is you just plug it into the wall and it takes excess humidity above, I think, 10 or 15 percent relative humidity in the air and it dehumidifies the air it purifies it sends that all out and it makes water up to three gallons a day and it's a couple thousand dollars i don't know if they changed the price since i bought it i got it at a discount because it was kind of brand new yeah twenty seven hundred dollars to twenty eight hundred dollars so it's kind of expensive if you're in a place that doesn't have running water currently and you want water you need water uh this would be a solution so something to consider for those folks uh, now and for into the future and then the next thing is just simply to build a power plant at your house. If you live in the southeast, this is a no brainer because you have tons of sunshine. So the deal is, is that you can get solar panels and batteries for very, very cheap compared to what they were previously. And you can save a ton of money on it, even if the power companies aren't giving you any credits whatsoever, just by being able to have that freedom and independence. So if the grid does go down, as it is for near a million people right now due to, due to the last hurricane, then this could be a solution for you, for your family, for other people nearby. There are lots of stories of people that have had home batteries that were charging other people's um, uh, different dialysis machines and other medical equipment that was necessary for them to live. I just highly recommend those two things. Build a power plant at your home, solar panels, batteries, and then get you a way to make water. There's also the source hydro panels, which I had at my old house, um, or the aqua vent here, I think is kind of the easiest one for most people. You just put it on your countertop and let it run and do its thing. So hopefully that brought a better sense of context into this discussion and what's happening right now. Again, my, my heart goes out to anyone that's affected by this. And I hope some of the suggestions I had here are helpful, if not today, in the future uh, for them. So if you know someone, please 
share this video with them. Also, if you're curious, I did a video just about EV fires recently. You can check it out over here. We really did a deep dive into the data, what we know, what we don't know. And so if you want to understand more about EV fires and the risks, check it out right there. Otherwise, that's it for this one, guys. Let me know what you think in the comments, and I'll see you back here next time.